Welcome to the Do It All Dad Year podcast, dad-friendly entertainment for you and me. I'm your unemployed host, Michael Kornbluth, which my wife likes to remind me of on a 24-7 basis. And this is episode 28, Anthony Bourdain Rips My Frozen Lunch Apart. That title, Anthony Bourdain Rips My Frozen Lunch Apart, was in fact my last short story uh, to get published. In Fire and Knives, which won uh, Best New Food Magazine in England in 2012. So, if my retired father doesn't take a break from CNN today to call me, I'll assume he still hates my writing aspirations more than Trump winning. Revenge suicide notes are a thing now. For example... Kate Spade suicide note, which will go down as the most passive-aggressive suicide note ever, read, it's not your fault, don't feel guilty, dad will explain. Meanwhile, dad's thinking, explain what? That I'm the one you can't stand? What a bag of shit, Kate! In case you're wondering, dad did explain in a letter, it was an op-ed to the Times, I think. But there was a letter. I read it on Twitter. This was the dad's explanation. Kate Spade's husband. Kate Spade suffered from depression and anxiety. Join the club, Kate. I had to explain suicide to my seven-year-old daughter on your behalf because she happened to pick up the New York Post that day and can now read and read the headline. She was able to read suicide and Kate Spade on the cover of the New York Post. All thanks to you. Okay, you feckless cunt. Memo to Sally Field. Burt Reynolds really doesn't like your wrinkled ass anymore. Has the Pope given Samantha Bee's apology uh, his blessing yet? Because you can't repent without his divinity spark. Long live Carlos Santana. Not a single player truly grooved his guitar rendition of the national anthem outside of Clay in Game 2 at Golden State. Everyone else looked like uptight cunts. How does Kate Spade trend longer than Anthony Bourdain? Of course, Twitter rewards the most passive-aggressive suicide note-giver ever. In related news, Netflix produced a second season for 13 Reasons Why Sylvia Plath is Hot Again. I'm still waiting for Obama to claim credit for birthing the Me Too movement, because so many high-profile pedophiles were brought to justice under his watch. This is my impersonation of uh, Van Jones interviewing Kim Kardashian. Van Jones, Trump is using you, Kim. And this is Kim Kardashian. Is the Persian-American community going to put Trump over the hump in 2020, you four-eyed fraud? Returns of... I'm sorry, not returns, reruns of Roseanne have been replaced by reruns of The Cosby Show and commercials for Ambien in heavy rotation. Justin Trudeau being accused of groping a woman sounds as believable as Obama being accused of groping Pamela Anderson in a three-way with Julian Assange to Nas's ether. Don Lemon calls critics who criticize NFL players who won't stand for the national anthem as fake news patriots. Instead of Stormy, report on servicing U.S. sailors on Fleet Week to thank them for their service. And I'll give you patriotic props, Don. It's now official. Philly is a sanctuary city. I don't think this is the form of prison reform uh, Meek Mill has in mind, or even Benny Siegel for that matter. Holla! This is my daughter. Daddy, why is Philly a sanctuary city? So Eagles fans come across as more genteel? At Deputown Balls in the fall. Trader Joe's organic raisin bran clusters should be called Diet Kashi. How is it even a debate anymore? For all the talk of LeBron's brawn, pipe cleaner arm Durant has owned the Goat Herder King in the NBA Finals for not one but two years straight. Still, Durant is only a tad less likable than Obama's enlarged droopy drone, Jay Sucker. You want to talk about 
Obama's accomplishments. Every time some asshole athlete doesn't get his way, he blames it on collusion. Obviously, that includes fake news fro. I think we all know what I'm talking about there. Miss America will no longer have a swimsuit competition. Can we at least meet in the middle America and give Tara Reid a participation trophy for still trying? Google lists Nazism as the ideology of the Californian Republican Party. In related news, Bing lists Munich as jihadist paradise. How unlikable is LeBron? Kyrie chose N-bomb hurling self fans from Southie over being forced to participate in secret Black Panther handshakes with the king of dour, persecuted petulance. Unlike the king, Kyrie knows when to pass and not force the issue. Facebook gave companies access, according to the Drudge Report. Facebook gave companies access to user records after they claimed to cut them off. Start a terrorist forensics unit to save face. Zit face, Zuck. Trump doesn't recruit terrorists for ISIS. They just target other lonely virgins on Facebook who wish their phones blew up. This is my impersonation of Anthony, the late, great Anthony Bourdain cracking up God in heaven. Bourdain gets a pass. God, this is... Who am I impersonating? God, this is Mario Batelli admitting to sexual harassment. I inhaled my sous chef's hair from behind because the smell of bruschetta in a hot kitchen was too hot to resist. I love Anthony Bourdain. I most likely never would have been, I wouldn't become a published writer if it wasn't for Anthony Bourdain. I had three pieces published in Fire and Knives. I mentioned it before. Beautiful short story anthology. I was actually the only American published in there. In not one, but three back-to-back episodes. First piece published was called I Don't Drink German Rieslings. Second piece published was called My Very Last Meal. And my third piece, they got the most prominent display, was Anthony Bourdain Rips My Frozen Lunch Apart. So, why do I decide to use uh, the awful news of Anthony Bourdain's suicide to bash my father? Well, one reason, well, because... I like to find the funny in the darkness of this world. Because like they say in comedy, Elijah, it's weird the narrative and have the last word. Uh, And I'd rather do that than dwell on self-pity and obsess about every slight of every occurred in my lifetime. I give some credit to that expression or reminder of that expression using Sopranos by uh, the esteemed Dr. Savage. So why did I choose to... Use my opening segment, double my dad for a little bit. I'll tell you why. Because I like to call out imposters or insincerity. That's what comedians do. You're not getting paid for it yet, babe. So after I get published, my overseas, in a beautiful anthology, my dad gets all excited. He goes, Josh, Michael. He calls me Josh. You know me as Michael Cornbluff for you loyal listeners to the Do It All Dad Year podcast. Dad found entertainment for you and me. So my dad says, Son, I'm going to frame all of your stories and put them up on the wall next to pictures of my grandchildren and all of your bar mitzvah photos from back in the day. And then I visit with my three kids about a year and a half ago. I said, Hey, Dad, whatever happened to you framing my short stories? Where are they? He goes, In the bar. And I said, But Dad, all your friends are Jewish and they don't drink. So basically, my published short stories are going to get less touches than a Bible in a bathhouse colony in Provincetown. I love that joke. It's older than Yiddish. But that was for you, Bourdain. Hey, Bourdain. Shrimp is... I'm sorry. Crawfish is shrimp with more personality. That's for you. I became a critically acclaimed Yelper for you after my daughter was born. 
I didn't have time to do open mics. And I decided to, because I, I had a news monitoring job that was going nowhere. I was squeezing in some open mics. But I decided to improve my storytelling ability. And I started documenting uh, basically uh, foodie fiction. They weren't foodie fiction. I started documenting my adventures in, in the big city. I was living in Queens. So I was able to try a lot of new restaurants, bars. And that was wonderful. I got wonderful feedback, Burdain, from uh, restaurant owners uh, that in both L.A., and Manhattan and Queens. And what I learned, and this is a little message here for all you do it all dads, uh, I would not discourage your children from shying away from certain social media platforms like Yelp because it is an open mic and it does give your children an opportunity to express themselves and also to receive uh, unsolicited praise. You can actually get a very a so funny nod, useful, uh, you can get written compliments. Uh, like one of them that's actually like pre-programmed says, I'm going to be in the audience one day, uh, giving you a standing O for your own pilot. That's a beautiful thing. Trust me, when you do open mics at Lesbo coffee shops in Park Slope with a total of four people in the audience and three don't like you, it's really hard to, and you're trying new period, new material, you're doing topical stuff, you're doing edgy stuff, you're not just licking their ass, uh, you're not just... Sucking up Obama to the last dying breath. If you're in this situation, you're not really going to be able to ride this amazing feel-good wave of positivity uh, that's going to take you from one open mic to the next during your bringer, prove yourself phase. So when I was able to take a temporary break from that, writing these stories on Yelp and really having an opportunity to get deeper uh, was a wonderful experience for me, and I'm grateful for it. So Anthony Bourdain, thank you from the bottom of my heart for inspiring me, for giving me hope to become a edgy, ball-busting, slightly sexually perverse, yet still deep, super romanticized writer. You're a New York original. I consider myself one too. I know you're originally from New Jersey. You're a New Jersey legend in my eyes forevermore. Up there with Jovi, Kevin Smith, Bruce. You guys know who you are. You're just as smart, just as deep, just as poetic, exude just more gravitas, if not more. I loved you. And I still think there's foul play. I just can't see you killing yourself out of the blue. You were involved. Dad, you loved your, your daughter. You had this new relationship with a woman that was involved with Harvey Weinstein. I'm reading on my Twitter feed saying that uh, the Illuminati uh, had you knocked off because your girlfriend had added Harvey Weinstein. Harvey, here comes Weinstein for the rape monster scumbag of biblical proportions that he is. I want that guy's head on a stick. If it isn't, this entire Me Too movement... Uh, means uh, bupkis, as they say. And I don't really think I'm you know, being uh, off by saying that. So I want to read right now, Anthony Bourdain rips my frozen lunch apart. It was inspired by Anthony Bourdain. Uh, I, I became a recommended writer uh, about 12 years ago. It's more like 10 years ago. For my 30 Rock script, I've always been able to capture uh, established voices very well. It's one of my few natural gifts in this world. So I'm going to share it with you guys right now. Here we go. And this is for Anthony Bourdain. I can't title an episode, Anthony Bourdain rips my frozen lunch apart and not read the story and pay homage to the late, great Anthony Bourdain. Today, you're no better than the other common office workers that wait in the kitchen behind you to warm up their own frozen food fuel. I'm paraphrasing here. But as Bob Dylan once said, how does it feel to be a complete unknown, eating lunch alone, like another office drone? It's time for a reality update. If you're stuck eating frozen lunches at work into your mid-30s, then your chances of stepping up in this world will just zap to death in the microwave and your career is ice cold. Understand, folks, I wrote this about seven years ago, right before my first daughter was born. Matilda Rose Cornbooth, a.k.a. Singing Rose. I'm going to continue with the piece. And I remember, like it was yesterday, wrote this piece in the New York Public Library. It was a blog that I was able to repurpose. Here we go. Oh, never had a bad writing session at the New York Public Library. Just throwing it out there. You tap into spirits. Beautiful place and they've renovated. How can you expect... This is Bourdain. I'll continue with the piece. How can you expect to build a ladder up to the stars... And climb every rung when you haven't outgrown the office kitchen or moved an inch up the corporate ladder since college so many light years ago. 
Did you actually think a frozen lunch from Trader Joe's would make you feel better about yourself? Do you feel secure inside knowing that you sold your soul to indifference and permanent career stagnation by standing in line with the other office settlers that live off such tiny worker bee servings? Is this your vision to become a loser contestant on the reality show America's Least Desirable Worker? How do you poke holes into your plastic wrap that covers your frozen lunch without trying to poke a hole through your neck with that cheap plastic fork that was lumped together in a box with hundreds of other plastic camp out at work utensils? Waiting for your coworkers to warm up their healthy choice trays can't be a walk in the park as the young girls look down at you thinking a man his age should have an expense account, important places to go. Yet instead, he's stuck here, waiting in line like some pathetic, defeated old man at a sample station at Costco who survives off their bulky packages of turkey burgers and other wallet-friendly, frost-burnt delights. Healthy choice lunches are horrendous. A tasteless display of prison meals designed for mass consumption. At least you went with a frozen lunch from Trader Joe's, but that still doesn't make you any better. You're only deluding yourself into thinking that you come off as a more sophisticated, environmentally sound, frozen food eater. You are still warming up your lunch. You've given up all hope for a richer, more satisfying life. So you actually suck more because you're a pretentious bottom-eating reheater that is no business feeling superior to anyone in the first place. I can picture your broke-down ass now rereading the microwave directions on your torn-open lunchbox just so you could avoid the sorry stares from your younger, friskier female coworkers that feel sleazy for being stuck in such a dirty office kitchen with a dirty old man that's been known to pop up Woody while staring at the cleavage as they wait for the popcorn to pop. I would lose my appetite if I had to reach into your splattered office microwave in order to grab such gross and gooey grub. Has that thing ever been clean? I can't see you office eaters putting in the extra work because you already settled for the quick, cheap, easy route, like taking the subway to work. All the other cash strap, strap hangers. Your outdated crud cover microwave makes the steam room with the Y feel like a five star spa in Napa. But keep on warming up those chillier delights at work. It's obviously done wonders for your imagination and drive so far. Reading repetitive, emotionless, ballless sports blogs on ESPN.com over a frozen dish of chicken fried steak during your one ordained free hour away from mind-numbing work that you can't stand is definitely a recipe for future success. At this rate, your five-year plan should be to blow your brains out if you're still doing this at 40. I'm 42 now, uh, and I'm an unemployed comedian slash father three and hosting a podcast, so at least I'm moving in the right direction. If you're going to think big, man up already and tear down those cubicle walls of indifference. If you're going to think, think big like Donald Trump says. I wrote this six years ago. Not like every other contented sales guy that enjoys web surfing with other fellow schmutzy slime brain drifters. I'm not calling myself prophetic, but pretty wild that I did in inject a Trump mention here before the fake news collusion story re regarding Russia became considered uh, actually hard-hitting, real-based news, even though we all know that story's got less legs than Lieutenant Dan. So how awesome is that? And also, a little creepy, I mentioned suicide here uh, in relation to Bourdain. I'll continue. I'm almost done here. You get what you settle for. Truer lines have never been spoken. So glad I came up with that. Definitely channel that through you, Lord. Not that smart. You get what you settle for. And I don't think you're ready to throw in the towel yet. Can I get an amen? I said amen. I said amen. I am not ready to throw in the towel yet, Lord. So get your ass or Bourdain. So get your ass in the fighting shape. I have. Start cooking again. I have. And fill your soul, mind, and body with affordable gourmet delights that nourish your dreams of real life success in the Big Apple. Big city. If you're going to make it here, start acting like you belong here at the VIT at the VIP table with Russell Simmons and the newly anointed Bad Boys of Comedy. Again, six years ago. Quick side note. It's my impersonation of Russell Simmons addressing all of his rape allegations. Read my lisp. I didn't rape any of those vindictive over-the-hill hoes. Not court of public opinion. What am I talking about? Just take him to trial. And we'll find out for good.
You have to graduate from the kiddie table and start dining like a cultivating young man on the rise instead of drifting from one dead-end job to the next without any celebratory meals or big game conquests in sight. True words never been spoken in relation to myself. Kick down those staff kitchen walls. Dream past your meager paycheck to paycheck existence and you'll see the light. Even though you can't afford to eat like a king yet, you can start acting like you crave it more than those stuck in their own frozen universe. But don't beat yourself up too much. The chicken tiki masala frozen meal from Trader Joe's isn't that bad. Written by myself, Michael Kornbluth, and the voice of Anthony Bourdain. Rest in peace, big fella. You embodied class, grace. You're a true American, original, a true New Yorker. You were the only celebrity that fell victim to Trump derangement syndrome that I gave a pass because I loved and respected you so much. You were so modern and so current, and you played such an unbelievable transformative influence in my life. So, you know, my prayers go out uh, to his daughter. Uh, your father was an amazing writer, uh, one of the best ever, and he was an amazing showman, uh, amazing filmmaker, and I love every everything Anthony Bourdain uh, did in his life uh, as far as the work. Writing was his salvation. He could have ended up a no-name heroin junkie, and he found the time to write his story, speak his truth, and that gave him a new lease on life. And, and that's a beautiful thing. So I love you, Anthony Bourdain. Uh, I can't wait to crack you up above uh, when that time occurs. This is Michael Kornbluth, your host for the Doodle Dad Year podcast. Dad friend entertainment for you and me. Working remote can make our kids great again. Talk to you soon.